We've got a baby orangutan in the front here. We think she's a little girl. We don't know how old she is, but she's quite young. She's quite small. She took her from a very, I think, small cage. The authorities, the police have already been involved. We don't really know what condition she's in. So we're gonna go take her to the clinic, check her out, make sure she's okay. I'm Paul Ramos, a wildlife vet who's traveled the world. A group of us want to delve deeper into the personal story of the orangutan. This used to be primary rainforest, completely land cleared, and they're just, it's just all dirt now. Here in Borneo, Indonesia, we thought we knew what to expect, but nothing could prepare us for the true realities. She's not, I'm not seeing any breaths, and her heart rate is so faint, I can barely hear it. I think, I think, we're, I think we're losing her. It became obvious that what was happening to their world was tied up with ours. We got rare access to leading organizations who are making a difference. And without centers like these to provide this sort of support and protection, there wouldn't be a chance. But through our adventures, we met characters <laughs> who inspired us and gave us hope. You just have to watch your back. Especially this one is um, picking up some clubs and sticks. Oh, Chinta. Oh, hey, there we go. And we met other animals that few have ever seen. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. This, this island allows them to really hone and strengthen those skills that they're going to need before they're released finally back to the wild. This is a rainforest 20 years in the making. We set out to find out for ourselves what is happening to the orangutans of Borneo. This is our story. There's the moment when you first look into an orangutan's eyes. We are connected. One of the largest islands in the world, Borneo is home to over 85% of the world's orangutan population. Because of rampant deforestation and its consequences, orangutans have been upgraded to critically endangered in 2016. They are now on the brink of extinction. We were given access to leading conservation organizations, each with the ultimate aim of conserving both the orangutan and its habitat. Rescue, rehab, and hopefully one day release back to the wild is a major part of their mission. The fate of the orangutan is truly unknown. It was the rainy season when I arrived in Borneo. Along with a couple friends, our first stop was to visit the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. Straight away, we hit the ground running. Okay, let's go. She's around two years old and they found her in a house and the people um, have been keeping her outside the house in a small chicken cage um, for the last year. They got her when she was about a year old, very, very small. There's no way her mother would have left her at that age. Um, what happened to her mother is unknown, but it's most likely that she was killed by poachers. She's been surrounded uh, outside by dogs and chickens and scary you know, predators, so it's been kind of a frightening life for her. And hopefully we'll make a much better life for her here. Animals such as this baby are coming out of the forest at alarming rates. This orphan, later named Hattie, was held all through the night. This may be her first real bond she has made since the loss of her mother a year ago. Since 1991, the Borneo Orangutan Survival, or BOSS Foundation, has worked tirelessly towards the overall goal of conserving the orangutan in its habitat. 
Covering the regions of central and east Kalimantan, or Indonesian Borneo, the foundation is the largest great ape organization in the world, looking after over 700 animals, as well as over a million acres of critical rainforest. Back at the clinic, Hattie undergoes an initial exam. You can see, we have to see in the performance, yeah, if the size like this. So we're just checking her heart and her lungs. Just then we had to be very quiet so you can hear all the subtle little changes sometimes that can happen. Checks need to be made so that she doesn't pose any health threats to others and that she's looking healthy. So one good thing about her is that she's really active. She's a bit fussy, she's putting up a fight, she's laying there comfortably. It's a good sign. Sadly, baby orangutans such as Hattie are an all too common occurrence as human activity comes crashing into their world, resulting in the loss of their families and homes around them. <laughs> Wanting to find out more about where orphans like Hattie are going to, we decided to spend some time in the rainforest. Ah, oh, right, so this, I'm so excited about this. We're going to go in with the, the infants, the little baby orangutans. There's 21 of them back here. Uh, most of them are from the, the, the illegal pet trade, animal trafficking. I've worked with animals much of my life, and some of them wild animals, but not like this where they really are indeed wild, and the idea is that they return back to the wild. <laughs> Over the years, this center has looked after thousands of babies like Hattie, each with their own unique story of struggles, loss, and hope. Our similarities are profound. Not only do we share over 97% of our DNA, but also the whole range of emotions that make us who we are. Happiness, joy, grief. Essentially, these four schools are replacing the roles of the lost mothers. Like us, it takes years of persistent, patient, loving guidance to learn important life skills foraging for food, climbing trees, building nests. Skills such as these will be fundamental in giving these animals a real chance to survive and thrive in the wild. Although the work can be extremely rewarding, it can be bittersweet. The best thing working here, just like when you have a very, when you have your own patient and you work for it, you just love it, like, yeah, I love being here. But at the same time, I'm very sad because, as I know, ev like every month, maybe, yeah, in maybe every month there is a new orangutan who, ha who we get from village. So I think something wrong in our world. Yeah, I'm so sad also. <laughs> like this one usually with my their mother, but see, they they with them. Babysitter, it's so hard. Like, yeah, it broken your heart. The teamwork that we witnessed felt less like a job and more like a misfit family full of love and affection. Like our kids, this little one here just does not want to take his medicine. <laughs> Patience is key, but sometimes it's just not your day. We thought these little ones were a challenge. Boy, were we in for a surprise when we met the teenagers. You just have to watch your back. Especially this one is um, picking up some clubs and sticks. Oh, not showing us Chinta. Much oh, hey, there hey, we go. Okay. <laughs> 
five to seven years in, these are the final stages of forest school, as they continue to learn to master the skills that their mothers would have taught them. It's quite humbling to watch as they regain their place in the forest, where in order to go back, they need to become wild once again. These animals represent the next generation of this critically endangered species. And without centers like these to provide this sort of support and protection, there wouldn't be a chance. Although orangutans are often the poster child for what's happening to the forest, everything and everyone under the canopy are also affected. Even though as a whole, people are the reason why forests are declining, like the indigenous Dayak communities, their fates are intertwined. These people are here in and amongst all of what's happening around them, so therefore they're very much a part of it. Yet one hopes that they have a seat at the table, and oftentimes, unfortunately, with indigenous people around the world, they can be a bit dis disenfranchised when it comes to the big decisions about what happens to the world around them. The forests have supported these communities for hundreds of years, but even in just the past decade, noticeable changes have taken place, as Daniel, a member of the Dayak community, explains. Sekarang ini perubahan banyak sekali. Kalau untuk suhu di hutan, dulu enggak tidak sepanas ini, lebih sejuk, lebih dingin. Dan mencari untuk berburu, mencari hewan yang biasa diburu sudah sangat sulit. But life is hard and options are few. There is a dilemma between needing the forests for food, water, livelihoods, and their culture, and day-to-day -day survival. Ya, bagi orang layak, pasti menyadari bahwa hutan makin berkurang. Tapi, belum ada tindakan yang ini untuk, apa, tidak merusak hutan. Karena kedatangan perusahaan-perusahaan uh, ke, apa, ke kampung, uh, khususnya orang layak, itu secara ini tidak merugikan malah mendatangkan pekerjaan bagi pengangguran-pengangguran dan untuk melanjutkan ini pendidikan atau bersekolah pasti butuh biaya dan sangat susah untuk bilang tidak untuk perusahaan-perusahaan yang merusak hutan By now we were definitely getting used to the idea that nothing was ever easy and health and safety? Well... We were introduced to the Center for Orangutan Protection, or COP, an organization that Daniel now works for, as the only entirely Indonesian-run group dedicated to protecting the orangutan, its habitat, and local communities. They take us upriver to the research station. As activists, they want to show us there's a war going on in the rainforest, and they are on the front lines. Even as we're sleeping here in the rainforest, I can even hear the deforestation. You can hear the, the machinery and the trucks of the coal mine in the far distance. It was time to go see for ourselves. Borneo is home to the third largest rainforest in the world. But in just the last 20 years, the majority of this has been lost due to the global demand for lumber and palm oil, an ingredient found in over half of all supermarket products around the world. In the same short period of time, most of the orangutan habitat has been lost and more than 100,000 or half of the world's population have been killed, making them critically endangered.
We just pulled over to the side of the road, just um, seeing this land clearing behind me. We gotta be really quick because uh, we don't want to be um, sort of called in. Th this is an example. I think there might be coal mine coming over there, but obviously this used to be primary rainforest, completely land cleared, and they're just it's just all dirt now. We're on a back road here. We we've just heard that there's a palm oil plantation around, and so we just have to be a little bit careful, and we're going to be a bit quick, but we're just going to go in, and check it out, have a look. Driving in, we realized the place was massive, like the size of a small city. The panoply of sounds of life in the jungle was absent, with only the crickets to greet us into what was essentially a monoculture. Now I can hear some big machinery, maybe a truck off from that way, maybe half a kilometer. Can't tell if it's coming this way though. Seeing a plantation like this in the flesh is a surreal experience. Although it looks like a forest, it's not. Very little life remains, and as a result, we all lose out on the many and profound benefits, such as healthier societies or even new medicines. This all used to be rainforest, and so they clear it all out. They take it all down, and they get a lot of money for those trees. And the reason why a lot of times they're allowed for that is that um, then it turns into an agricultural enterprise, so they plant palm oil. The difficulty is that palm oil is in everything, almost everything that we eat. I don't know of the answers to say no to palm oil. I'd like to find that out, but surely there's a better way. In Indonesia over the past two decades, palm oil has destroyed some 24 million hectares of rainforest, around twice the size of England, and this continues to rise. I'm actually not sure how the processing goes, but they take these whole things off in big chunks, and there's a sort of little nuts here, there's an old one here. In reality, palm oil is here to stay. And so the question is, how do we make it sustainable? On the road, there was a call out from park rangers. An animal had been found at the edge of a palm oil plantation, and its condition was unknown, and we we're the closest help. It's going to be 12 hours away, one way. So we're going. We're going to drive through the night. Lightning has been crazy. We've hit a tropical thunderstorm. I'm not sure what time it is, but it's black outside. And um, rain's really coming down. So we have to, not only are there some really big big potholes, almost sinkholes in the road. Um, we're going to have to really be careful about the traction in the road. And we're probably not even, definitely not halfway point, probably about a third of the way through. So we have a long way to go. But yeah, it's, it's really a downpour right now. By the time we arrived, the rain had stopped and the orangutan had been rescued. But what we didn't know was how bad things were for the struggling animal and how the experience of this night was about to impact us so that we would be forever changed. In a way, our journey started here. We don't exactly have the permission yet, so we're just gonna film and see what they say. Thank you for your coming. Oh, good job. Good job with the orangutan. The rangers had been monitoring this young orangutan for days as it fought to stay alive, hanging on to a small branch in the middle of a raging river. Three days. Three days ago. Uh, three days ago. Near palm oil. Palm oil. It's really, really unusual to find an orangutan in water than just not meant to be in water. And she's in the middle of the water just grasping to a stick. Um, right, right outside of palm oil plantation. And it was obvious that the orangutan may well be dying, and we might be too late. So, um, there's not much movement at all, but um, I think maybe, is, is, is it a girl? I still don't know. Yeah, I still don't know. So we're not sure, maybe a young one. Maybe a little, here she's just kind of reaching out. She's very quiet, she's laying down. I think she might be collapsed. Something wasn't right. It was as though it couldn't see anything, and it was too frail 
to even sit up. The orangutan is so weak, don't even need to dart it. Even though it looked very, very weak, when cornered, wild animals can still be dangerous. Still, we had to try and save its life. Flora, Flora's setting up the table. She's got everything out she needs to be prepared for any kind of situation. When you, when you have a an wild animal that's anesthetized, do you need to take that one moment to do all that you can do? Because it's your one shot, whether that's physical examination, weighing, vaccinating, whatever treatment there is. Right now, this is our one chance to, to not only have a look and assess the orangutan, but to treat it at the same time. So, be careful, careful, careful that she's going to up. Because it was so small, at first we thought it was a girl, but its emaciated, disfigured body showed that it was a boy, a young male, who had just been through a lot. This looks like a machete attack right here, and a linear laceration, deep wound, full thickness. That'd be like a weapon, and it's a defensive wound. Maybe at all. And then I noticed something. I brought your stethoscope. She's not, I'm not seeing any breaths, and her heart rate is so faint, I can barely hear it. I think, I think we're, I think we're losing her. And like that, he was gone. And I think he went very, very quickly. He was, he was collapsed in his cage already, and um, he wouldn't have lasted very much longer. You know, he, he, he would have um, been dead probably in the next one to two days by himself. Um, but it would have been a long one or two days for him. Um, there was. There was, you couldn't stand by and do nothing. This is, and the only thing you could do is try to help him, hands on. Um, and we knew the risks, um, but they had to be taken for his welfare. His body tells us quite a story. Um, he's been suffering for a long time. He's in very poor body condition. He's missing a foot, an older injury. His eyes, he couldn't see. He had defensive wounds against like a knife or a machete on his hands. He, he had a bullet, at least one bullet, probably a lot more. There's, that looks like a bullet hole there um, all over his body. He's had, a, he's had a, a very short, hard life. That, was, that, that, wasn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't a surprise at all, um, looking at him collapse like that. In, in nature, whenever a, a wild animal must always spend all of its energy looking well, if it doesn't look well, it's going to be someone's prey or be vulnerable in some way. So by the time you see it looking unwell, a lot of times it's too late. Um, I think he went really quickly. I feel bad. Don't feel bad. You did all you could. You literally did the best you could with what you had. Yeah. And those situations, like someone's got to be cool, and um, so that's me usually. And then sometimes I have to walk out and just um, absorb it after the fact, because 
because my brain has to work. So. The heartbreaking tragedy that just unfolded made us realize that this was only one story out of countless many. Driving back, there was time to think. Maybe there was more to the picture. That as an umbrella species, other animals than the orangutan are also impacted. One in particular remains a curious mystery to most. Have you ever seen a sun bear? Just rescued from animal traffickers, Indiana here has already stolen the hearts of everybody here at Boss. For me, on a personal level, meeting her on this morning made me feel something that had been missing. I, it's been a long time since I've sort of felt that magic with uh, nature and with animals, I think. Um, there's been a little bit of, you know, a um, little bit of burnout, but seeing her like this for the first time in a long time, I just, I can, I can feel again, it really, it's really inspiring to me. The smallest of the bears, about the size of a large dog, this elusive animal is found in tropical forests throughout Southeast Asia. With patches on their chest that resemble a rising sun and long claws and tongues made for a life in the trees, these curious animals are also under threat. Though little is known about them, it's thought that the population has crashed by at least a third over just a few generations. To find out more, here at the sanctuary, we hear the story of the sun bear. There's almost 50 sun bears in, in this facility. Once they're here, oftentimes they spend their entire lives here because really, once they reach the age of one, they're really not releasable back into the wild. They just don't have the skills and they're too used to people. So if they were to be released, oftentimes they'll just show up at someone's doorstep, which never ends good for the bear. Here oftentimes they, they come in uh, with injuries. Those might be physical injuries such as missing paws from snares or other type of abuse, um, but they also can be psychological injuries from years, years and years of the circus like this, this bear here. So Barilla is also a missing, missing hand and he's missing his leg. When they first arrive, almost always as little cubs, they end up in these cages as a temporary fix. Far from ideal, given the vast numbers coming out of the forest, this is a necessary step. Still, the people that care for them, like Hani, want a better life for their animals. We hope the bear not stay in the cages, because not good stay in the in cages same this. We hope uh, that can release and can make same the tropical forest for the bear special, for the sun bear, and good for the future. For some of the bears, new investments have enabled the building of larger, more natural enclosures aimed at simulating, as much as possible, a life in the forest. Eating a diet of primarily fruits, berries, and insects, they too are vital seed dispersers for the forest. This is a dragon fruit, and we have to take that um, bucket of fruit and spread it all around the enclosure because we want to make the bears work for their food as much as possible. It's part of what's called enrichment, so it's good for them to use their minds as much as, as possible within a, you know, a limited environment. Hiding fruit from a bear is all about getting creative. Yeah.
sun bears are notoriously elusive, but when the dinner bell rings, Volunteer Patrick, who's overseeing the creation of the new forest enclosures better suited to the needs of the sun bear, explains the vision and the challenges for the project. A normal bear in the wild would need a thousand hectares as its territory. Okay, here they don't get a thousand hectares for individual, they get one hectare for five individuals. So it seems really small and it's still a captive life and it's still, you know, it's still not what, you know, they deserve but it's as good as it can get. These new enclosures mean more than just space. They offer the prospect of not just a physical, but a mental freedom. But still, as part of the illegal pet trade being kept in a cage for a lifetime, some bears find it hard to adjust. This is Patung. For the last 12 years, he's been in a cage that's about six foot by six foot for 12 years. Two weeks ago, he was moved to this enclosure over here, so he, we're about to let him out into this essentially massive forest for him um, of about one and a half acres um, where he and his girlfriend have just moved. So he's getting, he's having some trouble adjusting, you know, after 12 years in strict confinement like that. Um, but it'll take time and eventually, hopefully, he'll get there. Even with positive change, animals can struggle. And we just don't know if Patung is going to take to his new environment. With his keeper worried, Patung may not ever make it beyond the bars of his cage. A few small but brave steps are taken, but he just keeps coming back. And eventually, he disappears into the trees. Back with their survival foundation, it was time to see the orphan orangutans graduating class. Living on an island in the middle of a river allows them to live in a semi-wild state while they wait. Here comes the sun. So this is the island, island of Kaja. It's an island in the middle of a river. These orangutans have been living on, um, there's over 40 here, they've been here for at least a year. This is part of their pre-release phase. This, this island allows them to really hone and strengthen those skills that they're going to need before they're released finally back to the wild. The big question is though, there needs to be somewhere for them to go. But this is as close as they're going to get at this stage to the real thing. The true reality of the situation, however, is that only a lucky few will ever be released. The rest will have to wait in their confines, hoping that the day may come when they can go back to where they belong. With an ever-decreasing habitat, that day may never come. When you stand still in a rainforest, you cannot help but to have all senses come alive at once. In all directions there is one thing, life. Though they take up only 6% of the Earth's land surface, rainforests produce 40% of its oxygen 
and are home to over half of all living things. So here we are at Samboja Lestari at the office and at the top they've got a tower before they had a satellite dish. We used to do some mapping of the area around here so we're going to go up and have a look. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Despite a fear of heights on a wobbly tower, we climbed to the top to get a better idea of what's happened here over the past few decades. Once there, we were astonished at what we found. So here we are, we made it to the top. Um, in the background is rainforest. And just 30 years ago, this was all completely logged. About 20 years ago, they started to plan to replant it, and they were just using a variety of, of species to mimic or essentially replace or build again a, a rainforest. And Tristan here, who's holding the boom, he was here 10 years ago, and he says that you could, you can just see the, you could see the bare ground all around. So this is a rainforest 20 years in the making. It's not bad. This is an example of when you set your mind to it and you think long term, you can, you can rebuild. But still, just over the horizon was a constant reminder of what Borneo is facing. Around here, I'm seeing in the distance, there is a clear-cut field that has been recently burned, and even a current burning right now, some, some ground is burning over there, I can see the smoke on the horizon. So we're surrounded, so this is a, a rainforest that's quite healthy, but it's an island in the middle of deforestation. Back on the forest floor, we met up with some of the local people who were part of the rebuilding. Even with the language barrier, we shared a common understanding and they were happy to impart their knowledge. Still, there's no substitute for getting your hands dirty. We're planting a variety of, of wood timber trees and fruit trees to really sort of represent what a true rainforest would be. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the fruits will be really useful for creatures like the orangutan, which are keystone species, which are um, really important in dispersing seeds and expanding the rainforest. So all around us, the rainforest is growing. You can see sort of different levels. Right now we're kind of a, in a place where sunlight can still get through, which allows plants to grow. Eventually, it'll be completely covered by shade with different levels of trees, and that'll be a proper mature rainforest. This one's still growing, and we want to help it along. Small steps alone will not fix the seemingly overwhelming problem that stands before the force, and therefore, ourselves. But sometimes, as on this day, you just need to begin. Well, that's it. This is the last one. It's been a hard day, but being here in the forest reminds me because I'm just surrounded by life from the bottom to the top. There's, there's just green, there's just life. And it reminds me how interconnected we all are to ourselves and to each other and to the natural world. And I think that's, a, I think that's what we need to do. We need to step back and see ourselves as part of it. Although I, I finished, I, I started down there and this is where I'm finishing today. For me, it's just a start. For years, I've thought of the forest as so vast and the problem so immense that there's nothing I could do that would really make a difference. The destruction, the pain, the loss was something that followed our journey all the way through. I think we're I think we're losing her. You, you know nothing but um, violence and fear and, and take. Um, but now, as I look back on this journey and as the experiences continue to sink in, I realize I was wrong. The way to a better future is a choice. It's our choice. 
And this is our turning point. What are you doing here? Um, I'm just chilling on a river. You know, uh, broken engine. Uh, starting to rain again. What's our plan? Our plan is to um, scream and shout for our dear lives when another boat passes. Ta da! I've got some robot tucker, mate. Get some, uh, some chips. <laughs> some, uh, some kind of wafer shit, I don't know. <laughs>